this is an issue that is particularly dear to me, not just because of my uh, familial background. My mom is from Colombia, and my dad is from uh, Chihuahua, Mexico. Uh, my mom and her family has a very uh, you know, normal story when it comes to the immigration, immigration patterns. They, uh, big family, big Latino family, uh, economic downturn in uh, Colombia, uh, really causes some severe hardship. So my grandfather's the first one to immigrate to this country um, and working in factories in New Jersey, Patterson, New Jersey, um, after saving up for two years, is able to um, bring uh, my, uh, my aunts and my uncles and, of course, my mom over. Uh, and this, of course, is post-1965. Uh, uh, and it's a little easier uh, in those days using their familial uh, relationships that they were able to come over. Now, on the flip side of that, you have my uh, father's experience, who also was born on a small ranch in northern uh, Mexico in Chihuahua, uh, I think a family of about nine, and uh, mostly males. And the biggest problem with that is too many males and only one plot of land you can't cut up anymore. Uh, so almost all the males in the family left. And when males of the family in a rural uh, Mexico start moving, they first move to the cities of Mexico where they can't find a job, and then they look for anywhere else they can find a job. However, without any kind of familial relations, my, my father, I think for his first couple of times through, came in uh, undocumented without, without permission. Um, and those two experiences, I think, really had changed and really uh, created a, a viewpoint of America uh, from my father, um, and that is entirely different from my mother, who came in through a different process. So this, you know, using that as a baseline, and 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 somehow ended up in Arizona, which has been kind of the the hot flashpoint of uh, immigration politics and rhetoric for the last ten years. Can really uh, uh, you can really take a, a couple of good lessons from it. Uh, one of the things that I, I'd like to point out to a lot of people is that if you look at what has occurred in the history uh, of immigration, and we were just you know, joking, uh, uh, and I won't name names, but some of us were just joking because there's this common idea that there's apprehension about the, the immigrants are, are taking over our country, um, or their children will be taking over the country. And I, I'd like to remind people that already happened. You know, that has happened many a times, actually. There are, there are many families that are named O'Reilly and, and Schmitz that uh, are here, and then they weren't here since the beginning of time. And the fabric of what we understand of America uh, has continued to grow and change with every new wave uh, of immigration. But there's many things that the, the 1965 law uh, did, uh, for, especially for the Latino community. We truly believe it's a very significant civil rights uh, uh, advance uh, that was particularly uh, important, uh, especially for the Southwest, it has a lot of uh, you know, years and years of relationships, hundreds of years of relationship uh, with the rest of Latin America. But prior to 1965, you know, the law was based on your country of origin. Well, many of that was based entirely upon Western European relationships, uh, something that obviously did not benefit people from the Southwest and, and of course, Asia. So while that was a, a, a good change, the change has not been fast enough, flexible enough, really to, to meet the, the demands, and, and largely labor demands. Um, we have had, of course, a lot of refugees have come in uh, over the last uh, 50 years, uh, and, and now starting some. But the labor demands, and, and really, uh, that, have been, that have been growing, have not been at, answered by a flexible uh, uh, policy, immigration policy. And you know, just to kind of think about this, you know, in, in Phoenix, you know, we're you know the hotbed, unfortunately, of, of human smuggling. Uh, we're a major route going north to south and, and east to west. Um, and my wife sits on the Phoenix City Council. Um, she uh, and I are very involved in you know Latino uh, issues and nonprofits. And time and time again, we'll hear about families um, that are spending twenty, thirty, sometimes up to fifty thousand dollars paying a uh, coyote to help their family cross the border. Uh, somebody who's basically going to take them from point, one, point A, just south of the border, to maybe 50 miles in, they're going to pay them $50,000 at most. Uh, this has created a horrible black market in terms of human smuggling to the point where you know, it becomes fairly violent. But if you just look at the economic situation of how ridiculous it is that we have 
people that are willing to pay up to twenty to fifty thousand dollars just to come to work in America for mostly menial jobs, and yet we as a country have not seen that as one an opportunity for us to make money. <laughs> I mean, uh, two, but also to be able to tap you know the intellectual as well as the entrepreneurial spirit of someone that's willing to do that. And lastly, what we're doing is creating a horrible incentive uh, to you know, turning, turning a, a larger and growing black market that first starts with human smuggling. And then eventually what has, what has occurred recently is because the individual person crossing is not as profitable, those young men and women that are crossing over after paying their, their ferry are also told, well, you have to carry drugs with you now. So you, our problems that, we have, that has occurred uh, and is occurring you know, in, in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Colorado, and now also, um, you know, even at our, our airports with many people coming, overstaying our visas, are really created because we as a country just have not, you know, responded to what, we, what could be really pretty basic uh, uh, labor demand, which is allowing people to be able to come in and come out flexibly uh, in, a, uh, in a work environment uh, that is stable, uh, that will guarantee their labor rights, but at the same time, passage uh, back and forth. So what we've seen in, in Arizona is this uh, wholesale uh, rethinking uh, of, of work as well uh, as uh, the idea of individual civil rights. Uh, as many of you know, um, you know, Arizona became a, kind of a hot point uh, in 2010 with SB 1070. Uh, something that uh, many of us uh, argued then and still argue and will continue arguing that it was a uh, gross violations of the uh, individual civil rights of, uh, of human beings and you know, uh, really a, a blemish uh, on the eyes uh, uh, of Arizona. And it was, uh, it was a very scary time. It's hard to explain unless you had actually lived in Arizona. Maybe some of you guys had traveled there. But in the name of security, uh, in the name of you know, securing our borders, and mind you, Phoenix is about 180 miles from the border, so <laughs> we're not, uh, uh, and Maricopa County in general, and we're not exactly on the border, but in the name of, of stopping this, uh, this menace, the ideas of civil rights, the ideas of, of private property rights were, were thrown out the window. Um, you know, we had a sheriff, an unaccountable sheriff where, with a uh, county government uh, that was basically given free reign, uh, who prided himself on violating people's civil rights, who has misspent and overspent now, the last estimate, over $200 million worth of tax dollars uh, in the name of uh, border security. Uh, and it uh, and was only continuing to, to, to grow uh, because of the situation that had been created uh, by uh, our, you know, outdated uh, immigration system. And the danger that I, I, you know, and I tell this to a lot of my conservative friends is that, you know, when it gets to that point where, you know, there's a lot of frustration uh, about uh, immigration uh, and there is no logical political solution, uh, what you do find uh, is an outlet. And that outlet is not necessarily a bad, is, is, is very much, uh, can be a very bad outlet. And I think you see some of that one with the rise of Donald Trump um, which I think is, in general, bad for all political sides for his type of rhetoric uh, and uh, xenophobia that he, that he is uh, spilling. Uh, but two, through you know, clearly illegal and anti-constitutional um, and anti-civil um, rights situations like have been uh, occurring in, in Maricopa County. But for us, you know, we and us, and when I say us, people who are advocates of comprehensive immigration reform, you know, we do have hope. We feel um, that this, uh, this conversation is moving in our direction. I mean, for the first time in a long time, we have allies just across the political spectrum. It was many days and uh, many years ago, if you would have asked the labor community, if you would have asked uh, some of the chamber communities uh, where they were uh, uh, on immigration reform, many of them would have said absolutely not. Uh, and now we find ourselves uh, in this new battle where we actually have an alignment across the spectrum uh, from high tech companies uh, to uh, labor uh, unions, to chambers of commerce, to the Cato Institute, 
um, and into many other organizations that are finally pushing off on the same front. Um, and we know that you, intellectually, we know through polls, that the majority of Americans are for comprehensive immigration reform. They want to see something done. They understand the system is broken. Um, but we're you know, still struggling through the actual political process of that, because it, it, not surprising to me, but might be to some of y'all, uh, Congress is a little behind uh, public opinion. You, the, the other thing that I, a lot of us worry is the idea of bringing, uh, fixing our Congress immigration reform system, but without actually uh, granting the right of uh, becoming a U.S. citizen uh, to uh, our, our brothers and sisters that are in this country, or the undocumented. You know, we have experiences with this. We, we had separate but equal status uh, for many years. The idea that we're going to allow somebody in this country to stay here but close any option of ever becoming a citizen, uh, I think it's just something at, at, my, at the core of many people, um, someone like me, it just it feels extremely uh, un-American. Uh, and that, you'll hear that debate going on. Uh, and many of us in the uh, Congress Immigration Reform Movement cannot see uh, a world where somehow we're going to allow you know, 11 million uh, people live uh, in an entirely separate situation. Beyond that, we do know that there are economic benefits uh, to the normalization uh, of uh, you know, the 11 million. When uh, the president's executive actions, and you know, there are arguments I know one way or the other whether he has the legality to do that, but the, we know the economic benefits uh, of what occurred uh, with executive action. There's a Pew study that was done right after, um, about a year after uh, the Deferred Action Program was started. Of all the young men and women, about 1,000 people, 1,000 young men and women were uh, interviewed across the country who just recently received the defer, uh, Deferred Action. And they asked, what, uh, the survey asked, what did you do um, as soon as you received Deferred Action? And they said four things, which I thought were fascinating. Number one, I enrolled in school. Number two, I opened a bank account. Number three, I got a car. And number four, I got a credit card. Now, that may scare some people because you have young people you know, buying cars, getting credit cards, especially if you have a kid in college right now. This could really be daunting. But for somebody like me who you know, is always looking at balance sheets and someone who is wondering how we're going to balance the, this when I was at the State House, how we're going to balance the budget because we don't have enough people buying, we don't have enough people selling, the idea that you can pos possibly have 11 million people overnight be, ha have access to education to make themselves better employees, uh, to, cred uh, to credit so they could expand their businesses or, or buy their homes, or to transportation so they could get themselves to and from work, it's something that we should all be excited, excited about. This is something that could be uh, an economic driver, an economic stimulus, if I could use that word. Is that word OK, safe to use here? We'll allow it. OK, thank you. It could be an economic stimulus without, uh, with essentially it being cost neutral um, you know, to the government, uh, to the taxpayer. If somebody's willing to pay $20,000 to a coyote, how much can we ask uh, as a government uh, for them to pay, for them to legally be, be part of the process. Uh, I guarantee you uh, they would be willing to, to pay us 20000 I think it should be commiserate to what it costs, obviously, to become a citizen. But if you start thinking of the thought experiments, it matters. Lastly, you know, in, in terms of the economic issues, you know, studies have shown that just someone going from undocumented to documented increases their savings uh, and worker, sorry, increases their savings and just their personal uh, wages uh, immediately from 5 to 15 percent. So if you take into, uh, the population of the country that we uh, believe is undocumented, which is about 11 million, and then of course the halo effect of, of their family members, which are largely mixed. You know, some, some members are married into um, uh, US, to a U.S. citizen, but they don't have their status. Their kids are probably U.S. citizens, but the parents don't have their status. But 11 million people suddenly receiving a boost in their wages of 5 to 15 percent um, in a short time period is something that we, I think, as a country would, you know, very much benefit from. In 
in just to start closing out, because I know we got to get to the panel, and I apologize. I think the other thing to, to remember, and, and many of you, I'm sure, are, are travelers um, all around the world. Um, I, I got to travel with the United States Marine Corps, you know, uh, first class travel everywhere. Um, and uh, as long as I could walk, they said. What are the things that, that you notice if you've ever been uh, to Japan? Um, and uh, I, got, I was very lucky to be able to travel um, in Japan on, on my weekends. <clears throat> and when you started seeing Japan, um, in the smaller towns that ring uh, outside Tokyo are essentially almost whole abandoned uh, uh, small towns uh, full of, of aging um, um, uh, Japanese citizens uh, and just trying to basically keep up with the basic uh, infrastructure of a city, which is the basic economy. If you, you know, many of us know the story of Japan uh, and their downturn in, in population growth. But it's not just Japan anymore. We've seen this happening in, in parts of Western Europe. We're even seeing this uh, happening now uh, in parts uh, of China. Uh, the one thing that we know is that you know, America actually has benefited uh, from our immigration uh, uh, flows here. If it wasn't for our immigrant population and their kids, our uh, uh, replacement rate, birth replacement rate, would be below, uh, would be two, I believe, below 2.1, below replacement rate. If we look at the idea of what we have, uh, what we modeled our economy on, we have modeled our economy on the idea of growth, continual growth, uh, something that you know has been going on essentially since the turn of the century. Should we, uh, you know, not find ourselves, I believe, dealing with immigration reform in a faster manner? Um, I do believe uh, this may at some point turn around, and we may not be the country that immigrants want to uh, come to. If you just look at in the last year, uh, uh, people crossing the border to come to this country uh, from Mexico uh, is now almost below 40%. Uh, Mexico's become a quickly industrialized country. The birth rate in Mexico is dropping. It's now at 2.3% versus at, at uh, its peak, which was around 3.6%. Uh, uh, a lot of our immigrants are now coming from Honduras, who's dealing with a lot of economic issues and Asia uh, at the same time. But at some point, as those countries become more industrialized, become more modern, you're gonna see um, those, uh, th those flows also uh, start uh, tapping off. So if we don't have a flexible immigration system um, that is based on the idea of bringing in talent, uh, we're going to eventually hit a, a, what I think is a, is a bad point uh, where we may not be getting the new vibrancy, the new entrepreneurial spirit, and at the same time, uh, we find ourselves with a declining birth rate and a, declining uh, economic uh, power. And for me, you know, one of the things that I, I truly value uh, about this whole experience of growing up and being an immigrant is uh, when I meet another um, uh, person who is an immigrant or is the, the son or daughter of an immigrant, the stories they, they share, just the entrepreneurial spirit, the willingness to just do whatever it takes to, to, you know, to be a good American, to raise a family, to start a business, um, and the capacity that they have uh, to truly change this country, I think, is, is not quantifiable. Um, if you look at what is happening in Silicon Valley, looking at what's happening in, in, in Seattle right now, um, what you see uh, is a gathering of not just great people that graduated from the Berkeleys uh, of the country, the Stanfords of the countries, uh, of our country, but you see men and women that are, have been traveling from the Indian Institute of Technology uh, to come here because they got their education, but they, knew, they know they can only start the business they want the way they want uh, in the United States. Um, if you look at Seattle, um, I have two great friends named uh, uh, Partovis, Iranian immigrants uh, that uh, had to leave uh, during uh, the Khomeini's rise. Uh, they got here, spoke no English. The one thing they didn't know how to speak was code, computer coding, uh, with, you know, First learning how to code, then learning how to speak English. They started some of the most amazing startups and now have created a coding uh, nonprofit that has spread around the world. We have the opportunity to bring some of the best minds, some of the most entrepreneurial minds into this country and gather them together and use all that power for our benefit. Instead, we're using an outdated system to truly keep out 
what was intended to be, uh, you know, what I think uh, one of the strongest and most powerful nations going to the future, we're keeping out that labor force that should be here and working with us.